Korah and his followers. In our last story, Moses sent spies to the land of Canaan. Ten out of the twelve spies brought back negative reports and scared the people into wanting to go back to Egypt. God, fed up with their constant doubts, denied them access to the promised land. They were banished to die in the wilderness, and their children would be the ones to inherit the land. In this story, we learn about Israel's first organized rebellion. Seeds of doubt were sown by Korah from the tribe of Levi. Those who rise up against Moses regret it deeply, as inspired by the book of Numbers. Hello, I'm Jack Graham with today's episode of the Bible in a Year podcast. In our last episode, we discovered that the Israelites' lack of faith cost them. It cost them God's promised land, at least for that generation. Because they failed to trust in God to give them the land and to defeat every enemy, they listened to ten spies who spoke words of fear. The entire generation would now die off. They would never see the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua would experience the promise that God has given We've previously heard the story of Miriam and Aaron defying Moses, but in today's reading, we'll learn of the first rebellion of the people. Led by Korah, a Levite, the people will turn against Moses, but their actions will have terrible consequences, and God will use their actions to remind his people that when they oppose his plans and resist his will, there is judgment to follow. Let's listen now to today's reading. The stars lit the skies like sand on the seashore. The camp was silent, and all of Israel slept in their tents, all but a few. Korah, a son from the tribe of Levi, had gathered a few of the elders around some burning coals. Together they stood in frustration and jealousy towards Moses. They whispered amongst themselves, conniving and scheming against Moses and Aaron. A wicked grin could be seen at the corner of Korah's face as they planned their coup. The men arose in the morning with intensity. Korah, with 250 chiefs behind him, marched to the tent of Moses. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron. They brought him out in front of the congregation as if on trial. The Israelites took notice of what was happening and began to gather around Korah and Moses. Korah smiled at the attention and raised his voice for all the people to hear. He pointed to Moses. How dare you, Korah shouted. Everyone here is holy, Moses. You are not the only one among us anointed by God. So why do you choose to exalt yourself? Are you better than all of us? He spoke with a frightening charisma. Moses refused to play Korah's game. The people watched Moses, anticipating a clash of alphas fighting for the right to lead. Moses looked at Korah, no doubt remembering the time he once strangled an Egyptian soldier in the sand. Yet instead of fighting or speaking, he fell on his face. The crowd watched as Moses took the position of bowing. While Korah exalted himself in front of the people and puffed his chest, Moses laid there silently in the dirt, mumbling prayers to God. Moments passed, and the people held their breath waiting for Moses to answer Korah. He looked up and rose to his feet. When Moses lifted his head, an intensity could be seen shooting from his eyes. His gaze locked on to Korah, the look of a warrior king, a posture strengthened by the Spirit of God. Moses spoke plainly and directly. He said, In the morning, the Lord will show who is his. We will both bring offerings to him, and he will choose among us. And Moses turned to leave. Before departing, he looked to all 250 men and said, You have gone too far, sons of Levi. I know why you rise up against me. The leadership God has given you was not enough. And he turned back towards his tent. Later that day, Moses sent for two elders of the congregation, Dathan and Abiram. He needed support from people with influence, yet they denied him, saying, We will not join you. You have denied us the land flowing with milk and honey. You have banished us to die in the wilderness, and now you act as king over us. 
At that instant, Moses' anger ignited within him. If they had only known the hours he had spent begging God to spare them. Countless times Moses had beat his chest before God, asking him to take his own life instead of theirs. If they had only known the sacrifice it took for him to watch the Egyptians, the people he was raised with, to drown in the Red Sea. And now they question his integrity, his humility, and his devotion to them. Moses' eyes burned with rage, and his fists clenched. With furrowed brow, he beat his chest once again and looked to God. Not even a donkey I have taken from them. I have given them everything. Do not respect their offering tomorrow. The next morning, Moses rose up to meet with Korah and his men. The entire congregation surrounded them as they would a coliseum. Moses and Korah stood opposite of one another, with their offerings prepared before God. The Lord whispered in the ear of Moses, Tell the people to separate themselves from Korah and his men. Moses raised his voice for all to hear. Depart from these men immediately, lest you be swept away. Stay back. So the crowd stepped back from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and their families. The three men stood by, watching Moses with their offerings in front of them. Moses rose his staff to Korah. Moses, once slow to speak and stuttering, spoke clearly and powerfully. His voice boomed, and the people trembled. This day you shall know it is the Lord who has sent me. Nothing I have done has been from my own power. Moses pointed to the men and shouted, If these men die a natural death, then I am made a liar and God has not sent me. But if the Lord comes now and swallows them up into the fiery shadows of Sheol, then you shall know whom God has chosen. In an instant, as Moses spoke, the land trembled and shook. A roar could be heard from the mountains and the ground began to split. The earth opened up before Korah and his men like the mouth of a beast, and they were swallowed up into the jaws of Sheol. The screams of the three men stabbed the ears of all who were present, and fire ascended from the depths and consumed all 250 men. The congregation fled, fearing they would also be consumed by the earth. The next day, the camp still smelled of burnt flesh and brimstone. The place where the earth had torn in two was within sight and acted as a haunting reminder of God's power. The panic of that day had subsided and was replaced by grumbling. You have killed God's people, they said to Aaron and Moses. Then they sought to harm Moses and Aaron, and in that instant the presence of God surrounded the tent of meeting. Israel had learned nothing from the day before. Moses and Aaron ran to the tent, knowing full well the fury of God was going to unleash once again. Get away from the people, God said to them, for my wrath is coming. Moses turned to Aaron and gave him incense to spread among camp, to intercede and plead for God to have mercy. Aaron ran like the wind, wanting to save the people from the wrath of God, but he was too late. A plague had descended upon them like a tempest. Moses and Aaron made atonements as fast as they could, but not before the Lord had taken 14,700 lives. The next day God had Moses gather the elders from the tribe of Levi to take shepherd's staffs and lay them at the altar. The one whose staff would bud with flowers would be the one appointed by God as priest over Israel. God would make it undeniably clear through a miraculous sign who would be in charge of the Levites now that Korah was gone. The next day, Aaron's staff had budded flowers and almonds, and no one questioned who God had chosen. Fear and trembling marked that season for Israel. They lived in constant dread of what God might do to them if they complained again. From this posture, they would begin to discern wisdom, truth, and justice. Israel's wrestling match with God was not over, nor was God's desire to bless them completely. Today's story begins with an early morning meeting led by Korah from the tribe of Levi. He, along with 250 leaders, were gunning for Moses and Aaron. 
They were envious of Moses' very special place in the community and wanted equality with him. Worse than that, they sought to discredit his leadership. So they went to Moses and Aaron and laid it all out in front of the entire community for everyone to hear. They essentially said, what makes you think you are so special? God has made us all holy. You're no different than anyone else. Get off your high horse. But Moses would not engage in an argument with them. He and Aaron fall on their faces, humbling themselves before God. When he answers Korah, he proposes a test. Both groups would bring an incense offering to God, and they would see who God would choose. But then he spoke boldly with the conviction of a real leader and called out Korah and the others for their actions. Had not they already been set apart as leaders? Was that not enough? Moses lets them know in no uncertain terms that the one they were really opposing is the Lord. Moses calls on other leaders like Dathan and Abiram, and they are also bitter about the loss of the promised land, and they're blaming Moses, and so they side with Korah. Filled with anger, Moses goes before God to urge him not to accept their offering. The next morning, as Moses, Aaron, and Korah, and the 250 leaders gathered themselves with their offerings, the congregation stands with Korah, which is an affront to God himself. God tells Moses to stand back so he could consume the entire congregation. But Moses and Aaron demonstrated true leadership and prayed for the lives of the people and pointed the rebellious towards repentance. When we come up against those who oppose us, even those who oppose God, do we leave them alone to their own destruction? Do we relish their punishment? Or do we step in and try to rescue them by pointing them to God? Christ himself faced rejection and opposition that we cannot imagine, yet he interceded on our behalf just as Moses does here for the people. God tells Moses to have the people get away from Korah. They obey. As Moses is speaking to Korah and the others, the ground opens up and swallows all 250 men, their homes, and their families. The people blame Moses and Aaron, saying they killed the men. So God says he will wipe them away with a plague. Again, Moses and Aaron seek to make atonement for the people's sin with burnt offerings. They succeed in stopping the plague, but not before 14,700 people perish. God sends a sign the very next day, flowers budding from Aaron's staff to show everyone whom he had chosen to lead the Levites. The people were now living in fear of God's judgment, but this would not be the end of God's struggles with his stubborn, wayward people. And yet his blessing and promise remained upon them. Dear God, thank you for Moses' example of humility and servant leadership. Thank you for how this story points us to Jesus himself who took our wrath and our sin and intervened on our behalf before you. We are so thankful for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. I'm Pastor Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make prayer a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, share it with someone you love. By sharing this podcast, you can make a difference in someone's life. And if you want more resources as to how you can know God and experience Him in your life, be sure to visit jackgraham.org. God bless you.